Fair Use Law is the backbone of the vast majority of gaming channels here on YouTube, so it stands to reason that there have been a whole lot of videos explaining just what fair use actually is. Unfortunately though, sometimes it's really not fair use. Admittedly, one of the Retro Perspective's earliest videos was subject to a copyright infringement grey area. Our video, Is Lara Croft's Character Taken For Granted, used music by Nathan McCree from various Tomb Raider video games throughout. It was before I had composed some of the tracks we use today. At the time I thought it was pretty effective to use music from whichever game was being explored in a particular video, and I plan to continue this practice. An argument could be made that this video still adheres to fair use law, because although I didn't comment on the music itself, the music is part of the game being commented on, and I attempted to use it in a transformative way to present a certain mood for the video. So why didn't I continue using video game soundtracks in our videos? Well, whilst I do believe this should fall under fair use, I also believe that YouTube channels should use at least some of their own music. I think it brings a bit of character and brand recognition to a channel. Also, YouTubers who can't make their own music are in a great position to bring exposure to composers who might be interested in creating music for the channel, and in turn bring their own fans back to the YouTube channel. It's almost like doing a YouTube collaboration only across different mediums. Unfortunately, channels that choose to use video game soundtracks in their videos tend to lean towards copyright infringement rather than fair use. This is because they use music from a variety of different games which often have nothing to do with the topic of the video. This even extends to YouTubers making videos on topics which aren't even anything to do with video games. Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu, who is already getting shafted by Square Enix willy-nilly putting his music into their millions of Final Fantasy spin-off titles, also has to contend with YouTubers putting his music in their anti-feminist videos. Now let's just remind ourselves that fair use is the use of a copyrighted work for the specific purposes of commentary, critique or parody of that work. So I think you'll agree that this is categorically not fair use. But hold on to your chocobos folks, because it gets much worse from here. When it comes to video footage of any part of a video game, the exact same rules apply on YouTube. Yet many YouTubers, from vloggers to video game commentators, use an excessive amount of video game footage, in tandem with commentary that often has nothing to do with video games whatsoever. Around the time Just Cause 3 came out, I didn't watch a single video about the game itself, but I saw so much footage of it from non-gaming YouTubers, I feel like I've played the entire game. Often, the YouTuber won't even note down in the video description which games they're using video footage from, and only on one occasion have I come across a video where the YouTuber clearly stated that they were using footage from a game for the purposes of giving it more exposure. I feel this is perhaps the only reason someone can justify using completely unrelated footage in one of their videos. Some of the bigger video game journalism outlets like IGN feel they're entitled to re-upload game trailers and imprint the video with their own watermark, as if they had any claim to the footage whatsoever. But certain YouTubers also do the same, with no commentary or critique. Basically, they're trying to siphon views to their channels off the backs of recognisable brand names. Perhaps this is a justifiable retaliation to the monopoly the mainstream gaming media hold. IGN can easily secure an interview with a big name for instance, but I recently noticed a YouTube video that had taken 90% of its content from an IGN interview, with only 10% being commentary. As much as I dislike IGN, it was their studio, cameras, lighting, microphones and time that made that interview possible, so to host that work as a video on your own channel is once again a blatant breach of copyright. Finally, there's perhaps the worst offender, and I did want to refrain from naming names in all this. However, this person is pretty much the self-professed king of fair use. Jim Sterling, despite being on the receiving end of a fair few copyright claims, where he was indeed well within his rights to use the footage in question, 
has, since the beginning of his career in journalism, had a very could-not-care-less attitude towards copyright law. As well as breaching copyright in many of the aforementioned ways, he also proudly uses his copyright deadlock method in many of his videos to make a point about YouTube's lazy method of flagging copyrighted videos by purposefully and paradoxically breaking copyright. Using a mixture of mainstream pop songs and Nintendo footage, Jim puts two companies in competition with each other to see who is entitled to earn the ad revenue from his video. Many people believe the copyright deadlock to be a clever way to show YouTube the error of their ways. The reason I don't think it's as clever as it seems is that if you really think about it, Jim is knowingly breaking copyright law to make a point about fair use. What would be really clever is if a copyright deadlock was formed completely from footage that actually was fair use. I'm sure it would be possible. Meanwhile, Jim is giving YouTube a legitimate reason to penalise him and his channel with justified copyright strikes and feeding the prevailing attitude that for YouTubers, fair use means we can use whatever we want regardless of what the law clearly states. Back when Jim's show The Jimquisition first started, the majority of the videos were underscored by Jesters of the Moon by Nobuo Uematsu. The Escapist, the outlet that hosted The Jimquisition, realised that this was not fair use and requested Jim change it. So he asked Binding of Isaac composer Danny Baranowski to write a piece for the show. However, he continues to use copyrighted material in his videos and recently has taken his disregard for other people's intellectual property one step further when he commissioned Carl Catron to write another new track for his videos. This track, March of the Sterling Jester, is outright plagiarism of Uematsu's Jesters of the Moon. They weren't even subtle about it. And with Sterling's history with the track, it's almost Jim's way of trying to use Jesters of the Moon without actually getting permission or giving credit for it. Of course, many people will see this as blowing things out of proportion. I understand that, and no one knows whether this would legally be plagiarism. As a Nobuo Uematsu-inspired composer myself though, I take issue with this blatant creative bankruptcy and disregard for his work. Not to mention the little known fact that even performing or recording a cover of a copyrighted work and profiting from it is not strictly legal. I'm no huge fan of copyright law myself, but I do think there's a distinction to be made between what helps the big corporations and what helps the individual. I do think we as YouTubers need to be a bit more measured about the amount of footage and music we use, because using fair use as a catch-all term to just say we can use whatever we like whenever we like isn't doing any favours to those of us who are wishing to forge a career out of YouTube. I've been Jake of theretroperspective.com and please subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Mm -hmm.